Ireland is divided into 32 counties. That runs from the top of Bloody Foreland right down to the very tip of Mizzenhead. This series, entitled A Country of Contrasts, is lucky enough to have an older person from every single one of those 32 counties tell us what life was like in their county growing up. And today we feature the county of Leitrim. Ah, Peter McHugh, born here in Horney Hill, uh, 1934, in the county of Leitrim. I had a farm accident back in 1990. I am convinced myself that I had a blackout that caused my problem. And I am convinced I fell against the tractor and got knocked out. And in, in a semi-conscious condition, put up my hands to catch something and caught the drive shaft with my left hand. Now, I don't remember the accident, never knew it took place. I can remember to the, recall to the last second coming up to the front of the tanker to put up a lever in the front. But I never got putting up the lever. And the next place I knew was six weeks later below in Stego Hospital. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was having a nightmare when I looked out and saw a nurse was going round the ward. I think for a finish I began to cry and the nurse came as far as me. She says, what's wrong, Peter? I said, where am I? Well, she says, you're in Stego Hospital. So I asked her why was I here. And she said, you had an accident on the farm. And I asked her how I was. Well, she says, thank your God you are alive, but you lost your arm. Now, I couldn't believe that at that particular time. And when it did register with me, I began looking for my left arm. But I didn't find it, and I never forgot that evening. It was pretty tough now. Being in hospital, I spent uh, 51 weeks in hospital altogether. I spent six months below in, in uh, Sligo and Manor Hamilton. And I spent the first, uh, next six months above and we have in Dunleary. Well, uh, one week short of the, the full 52 weeks. It was hard to adjust, but I had, uh, Lord have mercy, my wife was very good and used to be in to visit me every night at that particular time, along with some of the neighbours as well. And uh, she was trying to control me the best she could. And I suppose I, I was happy to be alive. That was instilled in me that to thank my God I was alive and that I, they would be happy to have me at home even without me arm. Writer Anne O'Dowd in her book entitled Mehel, a study of cooperative labour in rural Ireland and published by Four Courts Press, has this to say about the practice. Cooperation in agricultural work is an old practice in Ireland. Sporadic references to it are found in written sources from the Brehan laws onwards and official reports and other documents of the 19th century have many references to people helping each other out with their work on the land. Very little, however, is in print about its social and economic importance to the rural dwellers themselves. The mail was a very common thing back in my younger days. And it would be a novelty to get to a mail or to be asked to a mail to, to go to and either to, as a gossip to pick spuds or in later years when I grew up a bit to be fit to dig. It was a novelty. And it was a great thing if there was a man sick in the area and that he wasn't fit to dig his spuds, the neighbours would turn out and maybe dig his spuds in one day. There could be 10 or 15 or 20, depending upon it, might be there a couple of days. It would be great sympathy for a man, especially if he had a family and, and them young and that he wasn't able to dig his spuds. There would be great sympathy and, and compassion. And it, 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 they would talk about it and that time they would be killing from one house to another and it would be the general thing and somebody would be good enough to organise a mail. There might, there might be several to, willing to organise it and once you'd hear there was going to be a mail, you'd turn out without even being asked. Well, it was always common. Neighbours would walk from one to another, especially at making mud turf where it would take maybe six or eight men to make enough of turf for a man a day, and them six or eight men would rotate from one man to another to make their turf. That was common enough. And even yet making reeks of hay, there could be five or six men or whatever it took to organise to make the reek of hay in a day. And that would be common enough. One man would be making reek today and another man making it tomorrow if the weather permitted. If there was a mail at a, at a particular place, the, the neighbouring women would turn in to help the woman of the house there and maybe bring gifts as well that would help out, whether it be nine or ten men. 
or 15 or 20 for that matter. That would be common enough. As we were saying there a while ago, if there was somebody sick, like you mean, to be concerned in the area. And how they were doing or how they were getting on to be, if children were not being looked after as they should be, the people would be very concerned. I knew of um, one family where there might be seven or eight children and uh, the husband was fairly fond of drink and he might bring home a loaf for to feed them seven or eight children. And it, it mightn't be great. And there could be there could be a long time much of what they'd love to come home. Well, if if the child went to the neighbours, they'd be fed. If the children were hungry, they, they, they might go to the neighbour, hoping they might get something to eat. But I, I, I don't know whether there'd, there'd be too much of that now. I'm talking about the males, the time of my accident, I'm going to come round to the, making of the silage. When our silage was ready for making, there was seven or eight men there for two days after they're making he All they are voluntary to help out because I was in hospital. I can never forget the men. Well, it meant a lot insofar as when I was in hospital and my wife come in and tell me to have the silage made in such a place and dignity and to have the wife the silage made at home. It was relaxing at that stage. I was only coming, I suppose, out of my... Um, I, I was... Um, Alive with her. As far as I was concerned, I was I was dead for five or six weeks. So I had the sides made when I woke up in June. My head in action is right. The dancing master appeared for the first time in rural Ireland in the middle of the 18th century. He taught all classes. He was usually itinerant and sometimes was accompanied by a blind fiddler or a piper. He usually stayed about six weeks in an area, lodged in a farmhouse and taught the farmer's children free of charge to pay for his keep. Locals were very cooperative with him and would put a room or an outhouse at his disposal. In parts of the country, the dancing master would run his class in conjunction with the hedge schools and the different classes would take place at opposite ends of the same room. The dances, he thought, were mostly jigs and reels. A major problem for some of his pupils was that they could not distinguish between their right and their left foot. To overcome this problem, the dancing master would tie a hay rope on one foot and a straw rope on the other. He then would tell them to lift a hay foot or a straw foot as required. And that's according to an article entitled The History of Irish Cayley Dancing and it's featured in the website Cardia Rinca Cayla Na I remember Lassie's pals of my sisters have come in here and it would be common that time local lads I remember three musicians coming here from time to time to play music some of them did since God rest them but to be common for local young lassies to be in and they might take out the lucky me evening I was two odd feet uh, got me started anyway. Well, the quick step was the first one anyway. And uh, that would be, you, you'd spend a while of that before you'd, you'd chant the other one. You'd wait for the quick step to be played in the hall. The fox thought. And eventually, when you get on to the old time waltz, if you were able to do it, it was a novelty. There was a, a local man here that had a fawn and had. Uh, Learned Irish dancing and taught us all. He used to run an Irish class in in Clune and an Irish dancing class as well. And he taught, we were all taught Irish dancing as young lads and lassies. God rest him, Michael Reynolds. And he brought up Master Griffin, God rest him, to teach us the dancing. He would have been a real Irish dancer. That was free, which was better again. As a young lad, we carried from house to house. You'd be out surely maybe three, four nights of the week, until maybe you started something different, like Kelly and after Lassie's. It was common enough to Kelly, and Abraham himself, God rest him, he did since, we used to often go maybe three nights of the week to different houses. Well, they'd, be, they'd, they'd sit around and have the chat and crack, and that time there mightn't be any evening radios at the time, and there was surely no televisions. And the, the general gossip, the, no one to talk about relationships and one thing and another like that. Such one as first cousin and such one as first cousin once removed and that type of thing. It was common. 
They wouldn't know now who their first cousin is. Many, many a band and many a dance was at Dylan's Cross. It was common when I was a young lad. And you often heard of Margaret Barry. Well, there was a veranda outside of Dylan's. And the band usually was... That's where they were situated. And God rest Margaret Barry, I think she did. Well, she played upon Dylan's veranda back years ago with her banjo. And I never forget that. And oh, there could be several hundred, three, four, five hundred, depending upon, and especially the late that Margaret Barry was there. So it would have been, it would be hard to calculate upon, because you weren't confined to space upon the road. The Irish countryside is littered with mass rocks, and they are still considered to be special sacred places. The alternative venue for Mass in penal times was in people's homes. Word was put out about locally that Mass would be said in a particular house on a particular day. The neighbours would gather for what was often the only opportunity to be at Mass for a long time. Because it was not safe for the priest to carry sacred vessels or vestments with him on his journeys, these were taken care of by the local people. They passed the mass kit from house to house as it was needed. And that article explains how the stations became a rural tradition in Ireland. And that's according to the website corkandross.org. The stations would be twice in the year, springtime and harvest. You had them on your turn. Two townlands here, Anna Brynn and McConaughey, went together for the stations. And I used to serve mass as a young lad and be put down beside the priest for the breakfast, which was a novelty at that stage. Well, the priest would get a... Uh, he could get two eggs for breakfast, when the other people... Well, the t- anybody that would um, be inclined to take two would get two. But uh, I remember, God rest my local priest, when he was asked would he take a second egg, I'd be delighted. He so he took his two eggs. They'd be surely respected. And if there was anything wrong, they would be the first people on go to for either a mass or a prayer. And it was uh, generally thought that they could do something for one. Well, I would be convinced that they could. And uh, back in them years, even if you get a lack of salt blessed, if you had an animal sick, which was common at that time, pigs get sick overnight, and uh, maybe go the next morning and find a pig dead, and the whole thing would get a lack of blessed salt and, and give it in the feed. That was common. They had the belief that that cured the pigs. No more of them died. I, I know one instance of a neighbour that had three pigs and he got, he's, when he rode in the morning, one of his pigs was dead. And the whole thing is, it, it, the disease could be very contagious and very rapid. And the whole thing was to get it, get them cured before they get sick or, or get it preventative. And the, the blessed salt was supposed to do that. There was always what they call a cow doctor. Uh, in different areas. Now, I know that uh, there was a man over the road, Cow Doctor Brady. He was known as the Cow Doctor. He could make up a bottle. And there was another man down about uh, on the Sheelan or down there, a Dolan man that made up a great bottle to cure a fluke. Long before the vets were uh, familiar around here. It was to get Dolan's bottle. And when the, when, when the one vet that spent years here, when he come here, the first thing he done was to get Dolan's bottle and have it analysed to know what was in it. And he began manufacturing bottles. Or drinks. Cute, yeah, well that, that, that would, a bit wouldn't be a bit if he wasn't cute. Journalist Angela Long has written in the website irishhealth.com about the life expectancy of travellers in the Irish community. And she says, Health in the travelling community is like that of settled people back in the 1940s. Nearly half travelling people die before the age of 40 and only one in three lives beyond 60. Death rates are particularly high for travellers from road traffic accidents, suicide and to a less marked extent, accidental deaths in general. My other one called here from time to time. Very, very uh, respectable women with their shawls and very appreciative if they got something. Or they might be looking for a lack of flour 
or maybe a bit of bread or something like that, a lot of sugar. And they, they always got some little thing. They, they wouldn't be too hard pleased. And I know that uh, over the, a couple of miles over the road where I used to have to go by with a cow from time to time going to the bull. And while the children might be playing about the, the think your women or the gypsies that make sure that the holler at the children to get in over the man's way. They had great respect for the farmer at that particular time. Very, very nice people. I don't know whether we should call them gypsies or not or what, but some of our greatest entertainers now were born here beyond along the road. Born in a new road up up from Master Moore, they used to stop along there. That was the greatest place of all time. There was a great shelter there, no matter what way the wind blew. And uh, there's some other... Is there some other crowd of uh, travellers that, that sing and entertain? Travellers would be great if there were cattle upon the road that did night in that regard. Wondering if there were hours or who they were. They'd know that they shouldn't be out. That was common enough. The, the, if, uh, gypsies or travellers had great respect for farmers and vice versa at that time. They weren't looked down upon. They were, they were accepted as hard up or that, that things didn't go well for them some years earlier. According to the provisional findings of the Census of Agriculture, which was conducted in 2010 by the Central Statistics Office, Ireland currently has 5,917,700 cattle in the country, and that shows a decrease of 5% from December 2009 up to 2010. When it comes to the sheep of Ireland, there are estimated at 3.122 million sheep throughout the country of Ireland. And this is actually a decrease of 1.9% on the findings of December 2009. Well, farming would be my main occupation. But I did work at Carpentry as a young lad and up to the time I got married. Well, we milked cows at one stage, but we finished that and went suckling developed a herd, increased our herd to Suckland. We spent the latter years at that. Oh, my father was a farmer. Milked cows and fed pigs all his life. I inherited the farm from my father and continued on. He lived on day 1982. At that year he died. We were farming as father and son together from my finished school practically. I was hoping or thinking of joining the guards at one stage and it didn't go down too well. For that reason I declined joining the guards and stayed farming with my parents. We had making cows here and the first check that we had with Bruce Rosses when I were heard they went down five out of twelve cows. And I finished up getting Bruce Rosses myself. Well you wouldn't, there's not much symptoms, only tiredness and uh, easy mid sweat and eventually if it if it gets uh, if you get seriously affected with a d- depression can have a fierce effect i had all them symptoms there was one spring that uh, i was uh, having a little bit of a cough in my chest and in, in from february march that type of thing and i was hoping when i get a chance to go to my doctor to have it checked out and eventually when i did get in it was a uh, Somebody that was standing in from a local doctor, a young lady doctor, and she says to me, Peter, she says, you're too young, she says, you look too well to uh, not have cleared up that longer. She says to me, I wouldn't be surprised, but you could have brucellosis. She advised me to uh, go into my local doctor that he'd be home next week and have my blood taken, which I did. And the problem was that there was a mistake made with the testing of my blood and somebody else was deemed to be to have brucellosis and I was supposed to be clear for three weeks or a month it was several weeks went by anyway before it was discovered that it was me had brucellosis and I can tell you I, I cried that evening I, I felt uh, so weak and no energy and to think that that was how I finished up with me farming I know I drank the raw milk for years from our cows, when I'd milk the cows in the morning, I'd put a ponger of milk on my head and drink it. 
which was the wrongest thing I could do, but we didn't know that at that particular time. We didn't know anything about brucellosis in, in cows at that particular time. Well, it's been 10 years under it anyway, and eventually, um, with a local doctor here, Dr. Green, she advised me that there was a tablet to uh, combat the brucellosis or to uh, cure it, or whatever term you should use, I don't know. But I said, can you get me that tablet? And she said she could. She said there were side effects, but I didn't need. I didn't want to hear the side effects. I went for the tablet anyway, and thank God, after 12 months or so, I think I was cleared of it. I don't have any symptoms of it since. There was a lot of young fellows in very bad shape, very bad shape for years with it. John Floyd has written an article entitled So You Want to Show Cattle This Year and it appears in the website twinoakscattlecompany.com He says Showing your own cattle can be one of the most rewarding experiences in your life. Cattle that you have bred, calved, fed, raised and prepared to show actually being judged by a professional and selected to be number one in its category or class is a tremendous accomplishment. It takes work and dedication. So here is just one idea from this article in regards to what John suggests we should do. The next task is to blow dry the hair. No prom queen is complete until this is done. After washing, put the animal in a chute, purchase a blower and train the hair to lay from back to front. Comb the hair forward while you're doing this. Don't be surprised if the animal gets excited about the blower initially. Just stay calm. Eventually, your calf will trust you and enjoy the attention. Oh, the going to the market was common enough, especially with farmers. You'd be going to see what the prices were like for weeks before you'd be ready to sell, to be in touch with everything. And then if you wanted to buy something, you had to go. Walk to four miles here from, from here into the fair. Spend three or four hours on the green, walking, trying to herd your cattle and sell them at the same time. And I recall walking four miles out where I had a bit of grass, four miles the other side of the town, bringing my cattle out that I didn't sell the grass and turning another one out there and walking her home, which was a 16 mile round trip apart from the three or four hours you'd run upon the green. But that was common. Uh, People walk from here to Dora to fairs and maybe buy a beast and walk back. I remember going down to your place in Limerick one time to buy a bull. That's some years ago, 1972. Didn't get too much time for checking him out yet to buy him an appearance that day and chance your look after. Well, he turned out very lucky, very lucky, and brought great calves. Well, you're looking for shape and quality. The same as you were looking out for a woman. You want quality and shapes. You wouldn't go for an ugly looking one. You do it the best you could anyway. We prepared them the day before, surely, yeah. Well, if you had good black cattle and you got a bit of shampoo and washed them, you, you left them nice, glossy, good looking black. Same as the last you do up her hair. Perms and all that type of thing. Well, there'll be no curlers, but there'll be a bit of a gloss in her hair, the, the, or his hair, the next day, which would show quality. Appearance. it would be manner based. The article entitled Feeding Potatoes to Pigs appears on a website called Musings from a Stone Head and they give some good advice in regards to how to feed pigs correctly. They say, Take the relatively simple matter of whether it's okay to feed potatoes to pigs and if so, whether they should be cooked or raw. The answer is that potatoes can be fed raw to pigs, sheep, and cattle, but pigs have difficulty digesting potato starch in moderate to large quantities. Too much starch equals stomach upsets. Cooking overcomes this and the potatoes then become a good source of energy for pigs. It means that pigs rooting up a few leftover potatoes in a field, they'll be fine. But they should not be fed quantities of raw potatoes as part of their morning and evening rations. As a young lad, and we would be boiling spuds for the pigs at night. We would uh, always fed a lot of pigs here. And when the pig, spuds would be boiled at night, 
and see this level of strawberry spot, you might take it out and eat it. You mightn't be hungry, but it was so appetizing, you'd, you'd eat it. You didn't need salt upon it. But in, in later years, then, it was discovered that it was cheaper to feed them upon meal than it was upon pig, upon spuds. I remember back in some years when spuds were a pound a hundred to, se- to sell. And to feed them to pigs, they wouldn't pay for it. So we, we sold the, the spuds direct and bought meal to feed the pigs. If you fed the sow, you could feed her upon meal until she'd feed her pigs and rear them for £25, and with a little bit of luck you could get £50 for your letter of pigs, which you were making £25 for producing one letter. And if you finished them to the market, they'd make another £25 upon meal. And if you'd done that twice in the year, you'd, each sow was worth £100. I know one instance where a man come into the Martin Mall, and his dog followed him. The cattle was brought in, and uh, the man got hurt at the mart and was rushed away to Sligo Hospital and the dog remained about the mart for a week until somebody brought him home eventually. He was waiting for his master, he couldn't find him. An uncle of mine that went up to us meet brought back a, a, a pup here and we reared the pup and eventually she had a couple of pups herself when she came of age and my next door neighbour John McEwen reared one of the pups or got one of them and that dog was able to bring the cattle, no problem. And he was able to go down with them to the river to drink, to a neighbour, go to a neighbour's field, the gate would be open. And the dog wouldn't interfere with the cows until the last minute of drink. And he would turn them out then and bring them back up. No problem at all. Oh, that was a master, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a master. And when the uncle from my speed come back, and he wondered, was that a good dog? Would he bring the cows? And the other man says, hang on for a minute. And he told the dog to go down and bring up the cows. It was only three o'clock in the day, which was too early to bring the cows. And when the dog was going down to the bottoms, his master shouted him to leave them, it was too early. The dog didn't know what he said, and he's, he turned and looked back up until he talked to him again. Now he says, leave them there, it's too early. And the dog came back up, left the cows. The man from his meat could not believe that that dog had so much sense. That same dog... When his master died and the cortege had left from the house, the dog cried to her half an hour after him leaving. My name is Caroline Brennan. Thanks for listening. This series has been kindly funded through the Sound and Vision Scheme, which is a funding scheme from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Of Ireland. Of Ireland. Of Ireland.